with um, with some key messages or some a part of it or the key message that your audience will remember when you will be holding a talk. So in short, I help you about finding out what you should be talking about. All right, so let's say let's jump right into it. So, um, what on earth is a TED Talk and what makes them so special? If you ask one of the co-founders of TED, Richard Saul Wurham, he says that TED Talks are all about ideas worth spreading. And if you ask me, that sounds like total bullshit. I mean, what does ideas worth spreading even mean? What, what is this? But if, um, to be honest, TED Talks are not bullshit. It's actually the total opposite of it. Just could go to the next slide. Yes, and again. Yeah, just what I said, it's total bullshit. Uh, it's not total bullshit. What makes the TED Talk so special is that first of all, they are authentic. The people that you have in front of you are experts in their field. They know what they are talking about, such as the, the speakers that we have for our TED event. They are not necessarily the ones that are most known in widespread. However, they are experts in their field and can therefore share authentically what they will be talking about. Next, TED Talks are often relatable. So when you see them, you can relate to what is, talk, what is spoken because often they are quite personal because they also share some intimate moments. In Thirdly, TED Talks are meant to be shared. So it's not only like a lecture that, that you watch and that's it, no. The idea of TED Talks is that you speak about it later on and share it with your friends or just talk about it with your friends, colleagues or family. Fourthly, TED Talks are often contrarian. They talk about things that the white public wouldn't say or wouldn't accept, but that makes them so special. For example, one talk that I find very contrarian is a talk about abuse, where both the abuser and the person that was abused were on stage talking about abuse, which is just fascinating and what makes them so interesting. Fourth, TED Talks are inspiring. So when you see them, you're like, wow, that's so interesting. I want to learn more about this topic. And lastly, no, the second lastly, TED Talks are thrilling. So you really want to watch them. It's something interesting. You want to learn more about it. Because as the co-founder of TED says, you learn something that you are interested in. Because you don't learn topics that you don't find interesting. So the general idea of TED Talks is to make them interesting. And the last, last point, TED Talks are often intimate. Not like intimate in a shower like displayed here, but I think it shows the general idea quite well. So what do I mean with intimate? Often the TED speakers share personal moments that they have experienced and that they want to share to the general public. And we as well in this workshop will, will share some moments that we experience and that shape the way that we were, or we are presenting. So the next point, okay, we had now a general part of our TED, so you should now know what makes TED Talk so special. But the next point is the audience, because to be honest, everything depends on the audience, not only with TED Talks, but with any kind of presentation that you hold. And from my side, the things that really make the difference from your audience is first of all, the level of detail, second of all, the degree of seriousness, the goal of your talk and the topic of your talk itself. Um, for example, I am studying strategy and digital business, which I find very fascinating. And when I try to talk about it with, with um, people from business, they usually get what I'm studying. When I say, okay, it's strategy and digital business, they are ah, cool, interesting. But when I talk with my grandfather, for example, he doesn't have a clue what this actually means. So when I adapt it to this audience, I don't say strategy and digital business, but more like, yeah, I study business. It's fine. For even older people who don't know what uh, in German BWL or business actually means, I say, no, I'm becoming a businessman because that's what they understand. Just to give you an example of what adapting to the audience actually means. And 
As Laura mentioned beforehand, I was a first aid instructor, which means I gave first aid courses to groups of around 30 people that I didn't know and the people didn't know me. And the situation was as follows. So the people that went there, they didn't really want to go there because they went there out of pure necessity because in Germany you have to do these courses to get your driving license. Um, as it's connected with driving license, it's also mostly adolescents that are, to be honest, not so interested in learning something about uh, first aid courses on a Friday afternoon. They're also very long and the exercises that you have to do, like the, like the respiratory exercises, you have to do it with people that you don't know and that makes people quite uncomfortable. So in general, the, the base setting is not very good to teach people about first aid. So, but still, this course is super important because what they will learn will help them save lives afterwards. So what I did in terms of adapting to the audience is the following. I made it quite funny, but informative at the same time. Funny because it's adolescents and people don't want to hear something serious for eight hours straight. So when I, for example, talked about there's a burning house, should you go inside or not? I did some drawings with paints and everyone was like, haha, but then activated as well. And they participated in the presentation that I held. But informative at the same point, because there are some things that people are aware of, but don't really understand how it works. For example, a stroke, everyone knows what a stroke is, but not everyone knows how it comes or what the, the effects of a stroke can be. And that's then something where I went a bit more informative and adapted to the audience. So, okay, we now talked about TED Talks in general and we talked about adapting to the audience. But well, one central thing of a TED talk is actually the topic that you should be talking about. And Laura as well mentioned beforehand that Clara, Maxime and I did TED Talks for a course at ESCP. And when I was searching for topics that I could speak about, it was to be honest, quite frustrating because you browse through the internet and you see all of these topics that just sound super interesting and also so special. And to talk about myself, I didn't do the longest study on happiness. I have also, I'm not a motivational coach and could talk about uh, what, how great leaders inspire action. And I also was never a school shooter or never had in mind to be a school shooter. So I, those interesting topics are just not something I could talk about. And so I was like, okay, cool. Um, TED Talks are meant to be interesting, something super inspirational, but I think I have nothing to talk about. But that's just totally, totally wrong because everyone has something they, should talk, they could talk about. You have a topic that you could share with others that, that could also inspire others. And the questions that helped me in finding the topic I would be talking about were first of all, what do you, or do you know something that no one else does that is super interesting to share? Do you have something that, uh, that you are super passionate about or that you find super interesting? And as this is a workshop and we want to do it a bit more interactive as well, we would ask you now to go on Menti with this QR code and just type in a few words of the topics that you would be interested in and that you would talk about if you would hold a TED Talk. So just give it maybe one minute to fill out and we can see what, what are the results. As you can see, Laura is also going to share the link with you because sometimes the QR code doesn't work perfectly. So we we're just going to share it in the what's in the chat.
I think, Laura, you need to share the um, link in the chat. You're sharing it in the <laughs> presentation. <laughs> Perfect. So we now have the link in the chat. All right, interesting. I see some of you were maybe a bit biased about procrastination as one of the talks that I had on the slide were also about procrastination. Activism, self-confidence, travel, money, change. Presentation skills, a good one. Gender equality, nomadic life. Human in the loop, okay. Very interesting. I find it also super fascinating that every single topic is different. Okay. There to be different. Brand management, tourism, overthinking, neuroscience. Okay. I'm just going to wait just a few more seconds because I feel like there are other ones coming in. Motivation. Okay. I would ask you to keep the Menti link open as we are going to use it later on, but that it was, a, of course, super interesting to see what you would be interested in. So it seems like all of you already have a direction of the talk that you would be talking about. And maybe if I share my personal experience when I held the TED talk, I said to myself, I'm generally super interested about entrepreneurship from also having founded a company on my own. And I remembered that um, founding a company in Germany is just a bureaucratic pain. There are so many aspects that are unnecessarily complicated so I researched, is this really a big problem or is it just me um, complaining about bureaucratic processes? And I found out, well, is it, it is actually a big problem. And compared to other countries, Germany is very, very bureaucratic in that area. And I also researched if there are best practices that, that could be implemented. And I found out that Estonia, for example, is a best practice in that area. They have for example, it takes one day in Estonia to found a company, whereas in Germany, it takes one month, at least sometimes even more. And then I came up with the topic of the bureaucratic processes of founding a company in Germany. So that's how I found the topic. And it seems like you at least have a direction of where you want to head with the topic as well. However, there's more. Um, there are more things that you have to have in mind before actually have holding your talk. And one is, what do you want, actually want to achieve with your talk? Because your talk always has to have a goal. Otherwise, a presentation is just unnecessary. A goal could, for example, be to inform people, to educate people, to convince, inspire, entertain, or activate people. That are goals that a talk could have. For example, in my case, um, when I talked about the bureaucratic hurdles of founding a company in Germany, it was mostly to inform because I said that's something that everyone is aware of, but people don't really know it in detail. So for example, no one knows how, long, how much time it takes to found a company. No one knows what processes you have to go through to actually found your company. So that was my goal. But then I feel like often it goes into the direction of information of informing people but it doesn't have to be maxine for example held a talk about why commercial aviation might soon come to an end this one would more go into educating and demonstrating the reasons why commercial aviation might soon come to an end and if we go with clara she talked about raising let's raise good ai which would go more into the direction of activate so moving people into raising a good AI. Just to demonstrate to you that you don't necessarily have to be in the information area. Your goal could be very different, 
but it's super important to define one before actually working on your goal so that you actually achieve something with your goal. All right, so again, we had in mind what a TED Talk is about. You, we talked about the effects of knowing the audience and adapting it. We also talked about defining a topic and a goal. And from the preparation side, we are almost set. But one thing is missing, especially in longer presentations, it can be quite difficult to remember what, what you are actually talking about, what you want to express, what is the key thing that you want to deliver to the others. That's why, and if you could go to the next slide, Okay, I continue anyways. You have to find a key message. Maybe even two or three that people can really remember that after your talk, people could say, oh, I remember this talk. They talked, this guy talked about um, raising a good AI and he said that we should all collaborate, which is super important. What do you think about it? And even though it seems like that's something that is typically said, it's not, you can find it in, in several areas. For example, Harald Krüger, the previous CEO of the BMW Group held a very important presentation at the annual shareholders conference in 2018, where he basically presented the strategy of moving BMW from a petrol-based company to electric vehicles. And in his talk, he talked a lot about uncertainty that they're currently in and how they cope with it. And one key message that we repeated quite often was, you can trust the BMW group, your company. It was not expressed in these exact words quite often, but this was the key message that he wanted to transmit. If we go to Dr. Newpart, for example, who held a talk, a TED talk on social media and its negative effects, he said that many people would be much better off if they wouldn't use social media. It's quite a strong key message that people also can remember. And in my case, it was uh, founding a company should feel like walking through the red carpet and not a labyrinth. And again, this is not something uniquely for a TED talk, but also when you help hold a presentation for a case study, for example, at university, it is always good to have a key message that you transmit to the others so that they can remember what you are actually talked about. All right, and that's almost it for my part. What I would give you now is the five key learnings that I would give you from my part in order to find a topic that you should talk about. All right, the first one, TED is about holding an interesting speech that others can learn from, because you only learn if you find something interesting. Second, every presentation should be adapted depending on its audience. Third, you actually have an awesome topic for sure, just think about the things that you are passionate about. Fourth, every talk needs to have a clear goal to be successful, selected based on your audience. And the last one, today's attention span is super short, so define a few key messages that the audience can remember. All right, and that's it from my part. Well, thank you, Dennis, for your um, thought on how can we find actually your topic. So hi, everyone from my side as well, from every campus. We're really glad to have you here or with TEDx CSCP Berlin team. Um, I'm going to talk about how can we actually prepare your talk. So we have seen with Dennis that we might have a huge interest in something and we want to deliver a key message. So it's going into what we would call we found our topic. What I'm going to talk with you about uh, right now is how can we increase our knowledge, find some data from some researches on this specific topic, because as Dennis mentioned, usually TED speakers or either experts or professionals with a lot of experience in their field. So I'm going to talk about the knowledge and then I will briefly talk about how can we deliver, especially on the visualization or talk, but that's also mainly clever part. So, now, what um, maybe we can go through, yeah, thank you, uh, Laura. So we're first gonna focus on how um, and what should we research for our talk. Then we will see how can we actually simplify our research's results, turn raw data and Excel's nightmare into clear PPT slides. 
Then we will see how can we structure our talk into uh, a great story. And finally, as I've just explained earlier, the visualization. So let's jump right into how and what should I research. So what should I research? Actually, to do our talk, the most relevant things that we would need would be studies, reports, numbers, graphs, quotes, basically everything that could give us as many information as possible on our topic and on the industry we're going to target. So that's actually what we're going to research. But how can we research it? I mean, you probably would probably say Google, Mozilla, and other type of search engines. But for the TED or any type of other serious and professional presentation, you need data that you can really trust. Therefore, here are some advices of what type of platforms you can use to find your research. First, who suggests TED? It actually is the simple thing to suggest you, but TED is not only watching other TED Talks and copy-paste. On the TED platform, you also have TED Blogs or TED Hub, where you have some researchers or experts that are publishing some reports, studies, numbers and graphs, and other experts of the same industry or similar industry comment, add something, and it's pretty up-to-date, so you can use this data. The second um, sources that we would advise you to use would be official reports. It could be from organizations, non-profit organizations, government. We put here the UN logo for sustainability, for instance, but all of those type of organizations are usually using reports and studies with data that you can trust and use for your TED talk. The third point um, would be the specialized press. Let's say you want to talk about nature, sustainability, we put here the logo of National, National Geographic because usually they're publishing some really, really great studies on nature, environment, and so on. So you can also target, depending on your topic or uh, interest, the specialized place you want to have some report, reports from. And the last point, it's you are doing your own research. You are trying to come up with a Qualtrics form or a Google form and try to find something by asking people some questions and i would say that even more that's even better for you and when you're going to do your ted talk it's it's going to be even better for the audience because you're going to explain that it's based on your research results that you conducted that you found this and this is actually why we need to change our world to do this so this is even better just one thing regarding the one last thing regarding the research you have to bear in mind to be very careful with the sources you use there is a lot of bullshit on internet. So you really have to filter out what type of data sources you're gonna take. So we suggested this, you can also find some others, but please be careful with the sources you're using. So now that we have seen how and what you should research, the question is, how can we turn this Excel nightmare into this, which is a great graph on a Tate stage? Well, we will give you three main tips on how to simplify your research results and turn it into data that is easy to understand, read, listen, and remember. The first one, the first one is going also hand in hand with what Dennis said is, don't forget your core idea. Don't forget the key message you really want to transmit to the audience. And that's a common mistake in TED Talks and actually in presentations that you're going to research a lot about a topic in an industry, meaning that you're going to find a lot of interesting things, and especially if it is actually the industry of your interest. But it's pretty hard to do the difference between what is essential and what is not, what is really in the core ID and the key message you really want to transmit. So first would be find the core ID. The second would be draw a clear model, find your structure to present your results in the best way. And finally, the third one would be cut the unnecessary. You have to be concise, clear, and precise. And for this, you cannot just go on and on and on with an eternal speech. You have to go straight to the point and cut the unnecessary and display your key message. So now that we have seen how and what to research, how can we simplify our research results? Let me take you um, to the TED story journey that we came up with uh, with our team. So we split it into three parts. The first part would be the initiation, 
The second part would be the challenging part. And the third one would be the solution part. So for the first part, we took Superman. I think it's a common example and everybody would somehow um, understand it. So every um, hero is always, always starting with the ordinary world. So for Superman, the ordinary is to be the farmer on some clouds. But for you as a TED speaker, it just could be to state definition of your talk or the thing you want to talk about. Then you have the call for the adventure. Then the refusal of the call. No, I disagree with this. Therefore, um, using this theory or so on, meeting hopefully Yoda, your mentor, the thing that you're gonna go, the thing that, sorry, you're gonna use to go to the challenging part. In the challenging part, you're gonna have some challenges. You're gonna have some tests, some allies. But also, thank you. Also, you will probably go in the Valley of Tears, as one of a professor would say, in the cave, at the bottom of the bottom, you would find some enemies that you will have to find. That would be, yeah, some theories that are going against what you're trying to say. And finally, you will arrive to the solution part, which is the reward for beating the ordeal and the resurrection. Maybe with Superman, it's not so clear. So let me give you an example with our student society, TEDx CSCP Berlin, and take you to this journey. So our ordinary world where was before the COVID-19 crisis. We were planning the TEDx ESCP Berlin happening in October for an offline event. Then, so it was the ordinary role and the call for adventure, but the administration was also helping us. We found also some previous organizers that really acted as mentors, but the main enemies and the ordeal were the COVID. So we really had to fight, we really had to adapt. Um, to turn it into a fully virtual, even though at the beginning, not a lot of people were trusting in our format, but we really had to fight this ordeal. And hopefully in a month, we're gonna have the reward and the resurrection. But you do not really have or necessarily have to follow the Ted, uh, no, sorry, Superman story. You can also use your TED talk as a problem solving case. So in the following framework, we took this ideal uh, framework to show you that you can also turn your talk into a problem solving case by identify, define at the beginning your topic, what is the problem, then you explore, okay, this is the, the status quo, that's the problem, then you can take some actions, find some solutions that you can work on, and at the end hopefully look back and say, okay, if we apply this, we can build this. That's also a problem so, uh, solving case that you can also use. And then you have, you have to, to remember something that there is absolute, absolutely no right way to give, to, to give a great talk. There is no perfect framework. It's really you adapting your own story to some frameworks. I know that for, in, for instance, when we did the TED talk class, we did not follow a particular framework. We really adapted our, our stories to some framework. So you can also use for, in, for instance, the four start or the pop, spark lines. The one that I really like is the mountain with climbing the drama and then at the top when you have full attention you give them the solution. But the most important thing here is that you really have to find the structure that really fits your topic and yourself. Okay so we found we, we talked about the research, we talk about the simplification, we also talk about how can we structure our story, how can we make our TED story now let's go on with the last part, which would be the visualization of our talk. Yeah, here comes the slide. This is a typical consulting slide, um, but the problem is that for TED Talk, we do not really care that we're gonna implement the first part of the strategy from two to four weeks. We do not care. All of this text, it's unreadable. Nobody would really understand what is your key message and what you wanna say. In TED, we're using simple figures that are impacting everyone. For instance, the 8%. You will remember that only 8%, blah, 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 for instance. Or that in 1936, humans were running the 100 meters in 10.2 seconds. That's way more appealing than the first consulting slide, right? Well, that's also called visualiz visualization of your talk. And for this, we kind of summed up five main tips. So the first one would be that you should not think about your slides at first. It should be at the end of your, yeah, at the end of your work. First thing would be, as Dennis mentioned, interest, 
topic, key methods, research, simplification, and then, then we can go on with the slides. Don't do it the other way around. Also, you have to create a consistent look and feel. It makes total sense. If we're starting with a consulting slide, jumping to the 8%, nobody will understand what's happening. Then you have to think about the transitions, not only the slides transitions, but your topic transitions. So it makes sense for the audience. They still be, so that they can, sorry, still be captivated by what you're saying. And, and the most important thing, remember your key message. And the two, the two last thing, or somehow working in hand, is that you should at least, I mean, have as less text as possible. So pictures are really, really impacting when you're trying to do a talk or a presentation. And yeah, that's, that's pretty much it for the visualization. So thanks again for listening to the research, simplification, structure of the talk, and then visualization. And then I will let Clara talk about how to deliver your talk. Thank you, Maxime. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, so guys, we're at the final part of today's TED uh, seminar. And what's good and great about this final part, that's why I love it and that's why I'm doing it, is that you can use any tips that we're going to discuss now in any type of presentation you'll be delivering. So let's look what we're going to discuss today. Uh, also, before I forget, the presentation is going to be sent to everybody who registered uh, for this uh, seminar today. So uh, just sit, relax, and you don't have to write down that many notes. We will send you as many materials as possible. So what am I going to cover today with you guys? So the first part is dress to impress, right? I mean, we need to find out what to wear when we do our talk. The second is let's not speak. And in other words, for example, dealing with stage fright. And uh, then the next, uh, the next, uh, sorry, I'm apparently having some technical issues with, uh, here with the spotlighting. Uh, so now I am apparently spotlighted and more visible for everybody. So uh, the next part is the body language matters. So uh, pretty much it matters almost the same as what you're saying, or even more, you'll find in a second. And then the last part is speak with meaning. Afterwards, we'll wrap it up with a little bit of a Q&A and networking session. So let's jump right into it. So what am I going to do? I have a meeting the next day and I need to find out what to dress. So uh, I think the first thing what you need to do is know your audience. So in order for you to know your audience, you should know the dress code. So, I mean, you cannot always come in your favorite shirt. You need to know if uh, people want you to be a little bit more smart or more casual. So today we also, for example, discussed with Dennis and Maxime what to wear because we were thinking about what the dress code for our event is going to be. And other ways of thinking about it is also knowing what the others are going to wear. So if you know that uh, pretty much um, what the others are going to be wearing, uh, you should know as well what is going to make me stand out in a good way. You don't want to walk in with a ball gown uh, while everybody is just in their jeans, right? The second part is understand your stage. So you always need to know where you're actually giving your talk, speech, or um, just a general meeting. Is it outside or is it in a sunny, uh, is it in the sunny outside or is it in the building office? And as well, it's good to know nowadays, especially with uh, Corona and everything being digital, it's good to know if your talk is going to be filmed. So for example, if your talk is going to be filmed, uh, we recommend not to wear anything which is extremely bright, white, or extremely dark and black. And it's also not that great to wear super, super small patterns or uh, logos of um, other companies because um, that might be seen as branding and you might have problems uh, later uploading your talk. So the next part is choose your outfit. So what does what I mean by that? I think um, we focus a lot on what am I going to be talking about and how I'm going to structure it and what's going to happen, but actually, it's good to know what you want to wear. So uh, this is a way how to get something done in a most easiest way before you even focus on all the other things. And as well, what is really, really important is to practice in the things that you'll be wearing. 
So for example, I once wore a dress to a big CEO meeting where I was um, selling a new project within the company and I don't particularly wear dresses. And it was extremely, extremely warm. And I started uncontrollably sweating in the middle of the meeting because I didn't practice with the dress and I didn't realize that the dress for the summer was actually way too warm. But finally, actually the final tip is be yourself. Because if you're not gonna feel comfortable, it's all wrong. So yes, it will be good if you don't come in a bathing suit to your CEO meeting, but still be yourself. So you know that dress I was talking about before? I actually don't really wear it. So I was so nervous. I put on this amazing dress. I sweated through the meeting. And then I worked for six months with, this, um, with the CEO on this project and he never saw me wear a dress ever again. So you should truly understand uh, your audience and the stage, but actually just be yourself. So the next topic, which you're gonna cover now, is let's not speak or dealing with stage fright. So there is this word, it's called glossophobia, which means, uh, which is quite a fancy word, but actually just means stage fright. And actually, we all experience, experience it at some point or another. You've already perhaps experienced it, or you might experience it, which is completely, completely normal. But what I want you, before I give you some tips on dealing with stage fright, what I want you to think about is um, two things. So first, fear is a learned behavior. So through, it's like throughout our life, we learn things that we should be afraid of. So for example, when we were children, we're taught that if something is warm, um, so hot, the stove, we're not, we should be afraid of and we should not touch it. For me, for example, um, when I was younger, my cousin put, I think, 15 snails on my face. So I'm actually generally afraid of snails. But what is learned can be unlearned. Do you know about those stories of people who actually go on these flight simulators because they're afraid of flying. So they're practicing with them to learn how to fly, to not be afraid to fly. Of course, they're not learning how to fly because otherwise that'd be very scary. But for me, similarly, I actually was so afraid of snails. But then finally, my parents now, when I did my semester abroad in the Paris campus, I ate one snail. So I overcome my fear of snails. The taste didn't particularly help, sorry, everybody, but it's a way how to deal with it. So don't be afraid to face your fears. And the second point, which I want to give you today, we actually focus on all the wrong things. So what are we actually afraid of? We, you sit down and you're thinking about, and you're being nervous and you're thinking about, oh my God, they're not going to like me. Um, I'm going to say something wrong, I'm going to forget my words, I'm going to sweat, I'm going to look ridiculous. Do you hear what I'm saying the whole time? I'm saying I am, I am, I am, I am. But actually, you should be focusing on the audience because you are telling, you're inspiring the audience, you're sharing your news, a uh, new great product, or you want them to start a new movement or whatever you want, but you're focusing, you should focus your attention to your audience. Focus your attention to yourself at a different time. When you focus your attention towards the audience, you will actually realize that you will not have enough time to focus the attention to yourself and therefore be actually less afraid of public speaking. Okay, so those, keeping those two things in mind, let's have a look at a few tricks and tips of what to do when you're afraid of public speaking. So number one is actually kind of weird because we do it all the time. But it's brief. You know, before any kind of talk you should be doing, just calm down, take a deep breath. Okay. And then just continue. Even if, should you be afraid within your presentation? Like, for example, I think like two seconds ago, I kind of lost my thought of line. So I just took a breath and I continued. No one is going to notice. Don't think about anything. Just breathe. The second thing which I would recommend is drink and eat. Actually, it's a really funny thing because before we, were, we started today's uh, TEDx meeting and we had you all in the waiting room, we were all drinking our glass of water. I think Maxime was eating a banana and I was eating a piece of um, almonds. And we were just trying to get this energy down. Why? Because if you're gonna present your big meeting and you're gonna present your big talk, 
you don't want your stomach to start an opera, which is what happens most of the time to me when I'm hungry. So my tip is to either eat something, always something small, because maybe there could be an accident happening, which we don't want on stage, but eat something perhaps small, something you particularly like, like a piece of chocolate. Or if you're afraid that your stomach is going to get upset, maybe eat something that you actually know will not upset your stomach. So for example, a piece of bread or just plain rice, which sounds boring, but you need this energy inside of you to go through the talk that you're going to be delivering. So the next point, it's actually extremely hard to do online, which is... <laughs> But in when you hopefully, when Corona is over, we will be able to do it uh, to those presentation and talks also in person. So when you deliver a talk, look for a friend in the audience. This could be someone who looks particularly friendly, who looks eager to listen, or it could be actually a friend of yours. It would be good if you find multiple friends in the audience, because if you're going to be just staring in one direction, it's um, a, a little bit unprofessional and might not come across as uh, cool or good. What I'm currently doing right now, I think I'm staring at least at four people uh, to make sure that I have this feeling, even online, that I'm not just talking to myself. So even when you're delivering a speech online, you should make sure that you find at least one or two people on, as your friends to be able to tell the story to them. It will, you will notice that it will make it much easier to tell. And then uh, the next one, next point, is actually quite simple. Practice makes perfect. So it's good if you practice, of course, your topic. But there's one trick which I, which I have learned. Practice the two first opening lines and then practice the two last finishing lines. This way you can ensure that, the, that the, your start is going to be great and your finish is going to be great. Sometimes that's actually all you need during a speech. And finally, my fifth and final tip today is have a backup plan. Anything can happen. So you can forget everything you learned. Um, the internet is going to go down. You cannot showcase your presentation. Be prepared for the worst thing that can happen. What I kind of do all the time is I prepare a script beforehand and then I write down, write down the notes for myself. And even though I will speak most likely freely, I keep them uh, either right now, for example, I'm having them next to my screen or usually I keep them in my back pocket uh, later during the talk. So now we come to the body language matters part. Actually, why does body language matter? So um, body language, you're not just saying the words. People are also watching you. It's like eating is not only nowadays about the food taste, but actually it's more about if it's Instagrammable, right? So that's why body language matters. And what you can do are a few things. Stand confident. So there is, first of all, there is a link between our feelings and our posture. So if you stand confident, you will actually notice that after a while, you will feel more confident. So nowadays, right now, it's also important to sit confident, of course, because we're all online, but make sure to stand a little bit more straight up and again, breathe, and you will feel much better before. And you will also, you will have this confidency, which you will mimic to the others, which goes hand in hand with my second point, smile. Okay, what I mean by smiling is I don't want you to stand like this the whole time during the presentation, but actually smiling is about um, try to be as much natural, natural as possible because if I'm going to be extremely uncomfortable looking, the audience is going to be uncomfortable as well. So make sure that you kind of visualize yourself the way you want the audience to see you as well. And then um, the final point about body language that I want to speak to you about today is what is your thing? Okay, that sounds uh, like a weird aspect, but actually all of you have one, uh, maybe one or multiple things. Those are things that we do which don't, don't look particularly well when we present. So for example, 
for me, um, I have uh, one thing, which is I do the wrapper hand. Um, I try not to do it today, but my wrapper hand goes like this. That's one when I did it before, uh, especially. So I've been singing when I was, um, I think since I was 13. And every time I would be singing, I would be singing like this and continuously going like that with my hand. But uh, I'm not a rapper. I was most of the time singing musicals or jazz. So this doesn't work. But the cool thing and scary thing about the Euro thing, sometimes you can find a way, um, sometimes you can find a way on how to deal with it. So for example, for me, what happened was I realized I, I did everything uh, in the head imaginable to get rid of this rapper hand. I, uh, for example, uh, focused on it so much. I hold a pen in my hand while I was on stage. It looks all horrible. And it made me actually more nervous because I was so focusing on this hand that I could not sing anymore properly. So the trick what happened afterwards, and it took me a time to figure it out, was to uh, uh, always go on a stage with a cable. So, you know, you've got those wireless microphones, but you can also have a cable microphone. So every time I would be on stage, I would actually be playing with the cable and then my hand wouldn't look weirdly anymore. But everybody has uh, their own thing. And sometimes it's good to work it out. And sometimes you just, uh, uh, you just have to deal with your thing and don't focus too much on it. So if we look, for example, at Dennis, Dennis is a thing, which is that he goes into this defensive shoulder movement. So for him, it's important that uh, he learns for himself how to stand straight, but that, that, that he doesn't look like he's about to punch someone into the face. And Maxime, when we talked about his thing was that he's got this rhythm leg. So when he's on stage, he's about to, he's pretty much about to uh, go with his foot and look like he's starting to run uh, away from the stage. So we discussed it with Maxime and for Maxime, what would be a preferable way is to, for example, move uh, during his presentation to, for example, showcase something on the slides or move a little bit closer to the audience and then back. So actually, this is a part, again, I want to be a little bit more interactive before we go to the final part of my presentation, which is, uh, I want to know what your thing is. So please open the Mentimeter as we opened it before and tell me what your thing is. And think about it, because even maybe you don't know right now what your thing is, but it will be good if you, for example, if you present often, especially now in our masters or bachelors, we're presenting quite often, it's good if you ask your friends what your thing is. So for example, for my, uh, I don't have only the rapper hand. I also had um, this, um, uh, how do you call it? I would put my hands like this during presentations, especially during Q and A's, which would make me look like I'm extremely defensive. So it's good to know what your thing is and try to find it out and try to find a solution, but don't be afraid to just leave it as your thing. So we're looking now on the Mentimeter and here we have a perfect example of anything can go wrong at any time. So we're just looking, uh, Laura, is it working? <laughs> I think we're in the wrong, for some reason it's in the wrong area. Okay, don't worry guys, we almost solved it. Make sure to uh, refresh your slide, perfect. So now you, I think you can start writing in what your thing is. Being conscious, okay. Touching my hair. Ooh, mixing languages. I know this one as well. It's really hard, especially if you're in international schools. What do we have more? Looking at the ground. I think when you look at the ground, what's important to um, think about uh, is um, find out when you're looking at the ground. That's for me a big, uh, big thing. And if you're looking at the ground a lot, it's maybe a good uh, thing to have a presentations with visuals and really train yourself to look at the visuals when you're speaking about the visuals. 
stammer at the start. Uh, make sure to remember the trick that we've learned today, that you want to know the first two sentences so you can really have a strong start at the beginning. Ooh, a bit more touching my hair. Okay, I think touching my hair, I've done it a lot, as you can probably see, and I cut my hair now, but when I had my long hair, I usually, for the presentation, I put it in the back because otherwise you would be continuously touching it all the time. Just looking, what can we... Well, I don't know a trick about the French accent part. I think this one is a little bit hard to uh, find a way. Mm, biting, would it be hands or the mouth? I don't know. So what do we have? Hands in the back. Mm, okay. So I think, yeah, and playing with the presenter, that's, that's, that works quite well with hands in the back and playing with your hands. Um, I think it's good to find out, not many people know what to do with the hands, right? Uh, so there are a few tricks uh, on dealing with the hands. Uh, it's to have the presenter, but you need to make sure you don't play with it, of course. Um, so have something in your hands. Um, I think what I usually take is not a pen, um, but you know these uh, type of um, bobby pins, for example, they're quite helpful to hold those. And what I think is really good to learn is as well, as I said, work with the whole stage. Don't work just, uh, don't work just with your mouth and what you're saying. Work as well with the visuals, so showcase the visuals. Right now I'm showcasing my beautiful white um, room, <laughs> so not much of a visual, but try to move with the hands while you talk. Okay, I'm gonna do one more. Um, a lot of hand movements. Okay, that's probably the second part is to make sure maybe to um, hold the opposite ways. Holding a presenter could help you with uh, a lot of hand movements, or it could help you uh, learn as well to put at least one hand on your um, on your leg, for example could be quite helpful. Okay, and fast speaking, perfect. Fast speaking is gonna be the next uh, topic uh, which we're gonna be talking about because we're gonna be talking about speak with meaning. Thank you so much guys for everybody who participated. It's really interesting to, uh, to see what your thing is. And I'm super happy to later in the networking session to um, have a little bit more of a chat about what you can do to get rid of your thing. So the speak with meaning part. So actually, 70% of signals we are giving to someone when we're saying something is not what we're saying, but actually how we're saying it. So there are three things I want you to focus on when you speak. Number one is variety. So give your speech a little bit of variety. Imagine I would be sitting the whole evening and speak like this in this one monotone with you. That would not really be fun, right? Find a good pace. So for example, when I tell you personal stories, did you notice that I speak a little bit faster when I say examples or when I say my own, per uh, when I want to just start telling you a little bit more in detail? When I want you to remember something, I speak a little bit more staccato like cutting the words after each other and sometimes i even make a little bit of a pause don't underestimate the power of a good pause when you want to make a point the next point i want you to think about is work through your text okay maybe not all the time you're going to uh, write down a full paper of what you're going to be talking about but it's good to have some notes down on what you're going to cover and when you go through those and uh, practice, hopefully, for your talk, is um, highlight uh, those things that you want to remember. Those that are the most important ones. And when you speak those things, you should speak the way you want people to remember them. So with meaning. And you can also use this uh, technique where you, uh, for example, not just highlight the things that is most important, but you can also um, circle the things which are just examples. And then in your own practice, read the text again differently, changing your pace and the way you speak, depending on if you highlighted it or if you colored it or if you circled it. And final part about speaking with meaning is emotions. So you want, to feel, you want your audience to feel something. 
you want them to feel some type of emotion. So for example, for me today, I want you guys to feel inspired. I want you to feel strong because you all are. You have those ideas. You're, perf you're here at the ACP, which was not easy to get in. So you're all perfectly smart and capable. We just want the idea to get into the head of the audience. So my emotions today are a little bit more, let's say, hope, inspirational, perhaps a little bit comedic. I don't know. But what I'm trying to say, if I want you to feel these type of emotions, I also need to speak the way. So if you want someone to feel inspired, you cannot just uh, speak very slowly. Or if you don't want someone to be sad, you should make sure when you speak, you don't sound sad. So this is pretty much my part. And we, I want to give you a few more points at the end. So yes, you all got this. I already said it, but you do got this. And what is important to remember for you is why you're doing it. So for, perhaps you're doing it because you want to uh, do a TED speech and you want to inspire or start an action or whatever. Or you want to sell a new product during, or sell your startup to a VC. Or you just want to convince your friends that that movie you chose is truly the movie we, you should watch tonight. Remember why you need to be speaking and what you want your audience to remember. Focus on the audience. And what's important to remember, and I love this sentence, is the power of authenticity lies in your own story. Make sure you give your own examples. Don't be afraid to show a little bit of vulnerability because we're all just humans. And as I said, we all are a little bit afraid of public speaking. And finally, practice truly makes perfect. The more you practice, the more confident you're gonna feel and the better your speeches are going to be.